believe, in John chapter 1. So you can go ahead and open your Bible there, and, and then we'll turn to the book of Romans, and we'll make our way around quite a few passages, really. When we were in Panama City, we attended Highland Park Baptist Church. We went Wednesday night, and then we went again on uh, Sunday morning. How do I say this? I wouldn't, that wouldn't be a church that I would ever join or be part of. But I did appreciate the pastor's messages. He did preach. He pr- we heard a couple of good messages. It was a blessing. What I want to talk to you about this evening <clears throat> is a pre-tribulation position for the rapture of the church. And we understand that the second coming of Christ, I think most of you understand, is in two parts. The rapture for the church and the second advent, actually you could say, with the church. So the second coming of Christ covers those two parts. Pre-tribulation people, or rapturists, I guess I'll call them, believe the church, and that's what I am, I'm a pre-tribber, uh, believe the church or the body of Christ uh, in its entire, in entirety, I mean, every single person that's a part of the church will be resurrected and or translated. They will be removed from the earth before any part of the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy, which Daniel mentions in Daniel chapter 9, before that begins. Now, the basis for a pre-tribulation position really comes down to this. A literal method of biblical interpretation of the scriptures and also a dispensational interpretation of the scriptures. So those two things, dispensationalism and literal biblical interpretations. Now, I want you to remember this. Most of you already know this, but I'm going to remind you of all this stuff again tonight. The church in Israel are two distinct groups whom God has a divine plan. Once the church was established and built upon the foundation of the apostles way back then, 2,000, a little over years ago now. That does not mean that God was finished with Israel because there is a replacement theology that teaches that the church has replaced Israel. But God has two distinct plans for those two groups of people. The church is a mystery, as Paul called it in a couple of his little letters, uh, but never revealed in the Old Testament. Now this So we live in the present mystery age, we live in the church age, uh, and intervenes within the program of God for Israel because of Israel's rejection of the Messiah at his first coming. The church program is completed before God can resume his program with Israel and bring that program with Israel to completion. Now this, all of that comes from a literal interpretation of the Bible. So you're in John chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. He came unto his own, that was, he came unto the Jew, and his own received him not. So the Jew rejected Jesus. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So Israel, for a while, turn to Romans chapter 11, has been set aside, but not completely done away with. Now notice in Romans chapter 11 and in verse 11, and there are several verses in this, this is quite a chapter really, I won't look at them all. But it says, I say then, and he was talking about the Jews, have they stumbled that they should fall? So has Israel fallen so far that they have fallen completely out of God's program. What's the next two words? God forbid. Israel has not fallen so far that God has X'd them out. When you read the words God forbid, it means like no way. That, that did not happen. So that program with Israel did not end completely. It will resume. There are several arguments that are used to support a pre-tribulation rapture position, and while all those arguments aren't as good as some of them, perhaps, uh, they seem to add up with a lot of evidence that's strong evidence for a pre-tribulation rapture. Now, I mentioned a literal method of interpretation. 
I think it is frankly and freely admitted, even by others that aren't pre-tribulation, that the basic issue in the controversy between a pre-tribulation rapturist and other uh, people that aren't pre-tribulation, this is, this is what uh, Mr. Alice said. He said, the question of a literal versus figurative is one to be faced at the onset and says a literal interpretation leads to a premillennial position. Now listen, he said it leads to a pre... I didn't say tribulation right there. I said he said it leads to a premillennial position if you take a literal biblical interpretation. I think I told you this a couple weeks ago. Mr. Ellis is an amillennialist. So what's he admitting? He's not taking a literal biblical interpretation by his own definition and by his own statement. So the nature of the 70th week, and maybe we'll read a little bit from Daniel chapter 9 a little bit, but the nature of the 70th week is seen as one unit. Those seven years are, in his 70th week, are seen as a unit. Now, there are certain words in both the Old Testament and the New Testament that describe the 70th week, which give us, and here's what I want to talk about a little bit, the nature or the character of that period. And I want to begin in Revelation chapter 6. And the first word that I will mention when we talk about the nature of the tribulation period is wrath. So we're going to bounce around a little bit right here, so uh, keep your Bible on your laps. And uh, I usually put these rubbery, sticky things on my fingers so I can turn my pages faster. Well, I forgot to put them on tonight, so it'll slow me up a little bit, so it'll all be good. Verses 16 and 17. And said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. You notice it says his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand it? Now look at uh, chapter uh, 11 and verse 18. Which oh, I think we read this a few weeks ago. And the <clears throat> nations were angry. And thy wrath is come and thy the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto the servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. So you see that word wrath again. Jump ahead to chapter 14 and verse 19. The angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress, it says, of the wrath of God. Chapter 15, 1. And say it, and I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And then skip down to verse 7. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. Uh, I think chapter 16 and verse 1. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And that goes on and on. But then go back, if you would please, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. <clears throat> and I missed it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 9 and 10. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. And then go to chapter 5 and verse 9. For God hath not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And you can read over in Zephaniah chapter 1 and verse 15 and verse 18, and you'll find the word again. But the first thing you'll notice about the nature or the character of the tribulation period is wrath. The second thing I want you to notice, look at Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7. And the word here is judgment. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the foundations of the waters. So it's uses the second word is judgment, chapter 15 and verse 4. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, 
For all the nations shall come and worship before thee, for, the, thy, for thy judgments are made manifest. So again, he, he talks about judgments. Now go down in chapter 16, to verses 5 through 7. <clears throat> for her sins have... I think I turned too many pages. Hang on. Chapter 16, verses 5 and through 7. And I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets. Thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another <clears throat> out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. So he talks about judgments. And then again in chapter 19 and verse 2, he says, For the true and righteous are his judgments. So you've got wrath. You've got judgments. I think I got another one here in Revelation. Uh, chapter 3 and verse 10, which I think we already read. Oh, maybe we didn't. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard. That's chapter 3 and verse 3. Excuse me, verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of thy patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. So when you look at that verse, you, it, this really, this is like the hour of trial or the hour of temptation. I mean, this is a bad, bad time. Now I want you to go back to the Old Testament, <clears throat> the book of Isaiah, chapter 26. Verses 20 and 21. Come, my people, enter thou unto thy chambers, and shut the doors about thee. Hide thyself, it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood, and shall no more cover her slain. We also read earlier in chapter 34 and verses 1 through 3, we read a little bit further than that, but in those first three verses there, the word indignation is used again. Now that's the same thing almost as wrath, fierceness. It's almost like God is moved with wrath or anger. Uh, then let's see, we got some more in, in uh, Isaiah. Go back to chapter 24, <clears throat> verse 20 and 21. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall be removed like a cottage and the transgression there, thereof shall be heavy upon it and it shall fall and not rise again. And it shall come to pass in that day <clears throat> that the Lord shall punish the hosts of the high ones that are on high and the kings of the earth upon the earth. So what do we have? We have punishment. God's going to punish them. So you think about this, this 70th week. Wrath. Judgment, indignation, punishment, the hour of trial in Jeremiah chapter 30. I guess we're close, so turn there. I've flipped to that one. Verse 7. <clears throat> Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. So now it's called uh, Jacob's trouble, the hour of trouble, you could say. And then in Joel chapter 1 and verse 15, the word destruction is used. In Joel 2, 2 and Zephaniah 1 and Amos, it uses the word darkness. Now that is the nature and the character and all of those references describe the period in its entirety, not just a portion of it, but the in entire 70th week is spoken of as that. Now look at Revelation chapter 6. You say, well, Pastor, that seems to be pretty obvious. It does. But, and you might even say, well, how would they get around that? I was looking at a couple of their uh, theologians that, that, that teach other than a pre-tribulation position, and they completely avoid the verses that we started with in verses 16 and 17. They don't mention them one way or the other. That said, in the mount, to the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come 
and who shall be able to stand. So one of the ways they get around that is they just ignore those two verses. And if you ignore those two verses, then you don't have to deal with those two verses. But I also want you to think about this. <clears throat> I want you to think about the scope of the 70th week. Now, this is a period where obviously, with all the references that we just read, where the wrath of God is poured out upon the entire earth. Now, we read Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10, but let me read it to you one more time, and I'll give you some other references. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. And by the way, the pandemic that we've lived through for over a year now, that is not wrath. That is not like you're going to see in the tribulation period. But it is global. It is, it's all over the world. I know that. Then again, uh, let's, uh, well, we already read Isaiah 34 too. You can also read the first 21 verses if you want to. In Isaiah chapter 24, you'll find the same thing. There's several other passages that make that clear. And yet while the entire earth is in view, this period, this 70th week of Daniel's prophecy, in particularly, it has to do in relation to Israel. Now, we read, I think we read, maybe we didn't, in, in, in Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7, I'm pretty sure we read that, he calls it the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob is a reference to Israel. And the events, turn to Daniel chapter 9. The events of the 70th week are events of the day of the Lord. And when this period is being anticipated, as we'll see here in a moment in Daniel 9, God says to the prophet, now let's look at verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. So Daniel's people would be the people of Israel, right? And the holy city would be the city of Jerusalem to finish the transgressions and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Now, there are six things there, and none of those things have happened. So this is all future. And that 70th week that is seen is one unit. You can read on down there a few more verses if you want to. So the whole period, all seven years, has a special reference to Daniel's people, Israel, and to Daniel's city, Jerusalem. New Testament passages, like Ephesians chapter 3, let's turn over there now, I, I mentioned this earlier. I'll have to try to hurry. Verses, this is a lot of Bible reading there, Jess. <laughs> Faith is glad she's sitting down. Ephesians 3, for this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words. Now, I'll stop reading there, but you can read to verse 6. The church period is called a mystery. A mystery is something that was once hidden, but is now revealed. Turn a couple more passages over to Colossians, verse 25, uh, chapter 1 and verse 25. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery, which has been hid from the ages, from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of the mystery of the Gentiles, which is in Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, makes it very clear that the church was a mystery and its nature as a body is composed of both Jews and Gentiles alike. And it was unsolved in the Old Testament, the church, it was a mystery, uh, but now it's revealed. Now, since the church had no part in the first 69 weeks of Daniel's prophecy, which is related only to God's plan for Israel, it doesn't have any part 
in his 70th week, which is also God's plan for Israel. And uh, after the mystery program of the church is taken off from the church. I think that is a very strong argument for a pre-tribulation rapture person. Kelly, after he dealt with Matthew 24 and Daniel 12 and Luke 21 and Mark 16 and Jeremiah 30 and Revelation chapter 7, he said this. <clears throat> he said, the view here maintained follows on a close investigation, and there was a lot of chapters he looked at, of every distinct passage that Scripture affords upon the subject of the Great Tribulation. I should be obligated to anyone who will produce me other passages that refer to it, but I am not aware of them. I demand of those, whether they can point out one word which supposes a Christian or the church on the earth when the Great Tribulation arrives. Have we not seen what the doctrine of uh, Old and New Testaments of Jeremiah, Daniel, of the Lord Jesus, and of the Apostle John is this, that just before the Lord appears in glory will come the last and unqualified trouble of Israel, through Jacob shall be delivered from it, that there will be the great tribulation, out of which a multitude of Gentiles emerge, but that both Jacob and the Gentiles are totally distinct from the Christian or the church. As regards to the Christian, the positive promise of the Lord is that such as have kept the word of his patience, he will keep out of the hour of trial, which is about to come upon the whole habitat of the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. I guess you could call people in the tribulation earth dwellers or something. Anyway, then I want you to also think about this. What is the purpose of the tribulation? I mean, why seven years? Well, in Revelation chapter 3, if you want to go back there and look at it in verse 10 again, it kind of states it pretty clearly. There are actually two things. Because thou hast kept them from thy word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the world, here's the first one, to try them that dwell upon the earth. But it's not the church. This same expression occurs in Revelation 6.10, Revelation 11.10, 13.8, 12, 14, 14, 6, and 17.8. Thyssen writes this, the judgment referred to in Revelation 3.10 is directed against the earth dwellers of that day, against those who have sitted down in the earth as their real home. Now we sing the song, what? This world is not my home, I'm just passing through. But so he calls these the earth dwellers who've sitted down in the earth as their real home, who have identified themselves with the earth's commerce and religion. And that would not be the church. So the word to try exposes purpose, which is to inflict evil upon one in order to prove his character and the steadfastness of his faith. That is true for tribulation saints. Since the Father, and listen closely now, never sees the church except in Christ. We are perfected him, perfected in him. This period can have no reference to the church. The true church, the true believer, does not need to be tested to see if her faith is genuine. We're in Christ. Now that ought to encourage you to step back and say, man, look what God has given me. Look how privileged I am to be part of the body of Christ, to be part of his bride, to be part of the church. I can, how can I not live for him? How can I not just give my life and do whatever he asks me to do? It's never a license to sin or live any way that you want to live. So the first purpose is to try the earth dwellers. We're going to steal a, a phrase from somebody there. The second major purpose of the 70th week, and I want you to turn to Malachi chapter 4. And I want you to pay attention to this because I am not sure how some people miss this. But I was going to bring this up a few weeks ago, but I kind of ran out of time. <clears throat> but I want you to notice the wording in verses 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. We were talking about the two witnesses. It says, I will send you Elijah the prophet. That's a specific word. And he shall turn the heart of their fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. <clears throat> now he says, I'm going to send you Elijah. 
The prophet states that the ministry of this Elijah was a ministry to prepare the people for the king who was to come shortly. Now look at Luke chapter 1 and verse 17. Now this is worded a mouse hair differently. He says, and he shall go before him in the spirit and, and the power of Elias. Does it say that that's Elijah or the spirit of power of Elijah? Because I'm going to tell you something. What you think about that will change the way you think. If you spiritualize Elijah from Malachi and say, oh, that's not real Elijah. That's just somebody in the spirit and the power of Elijah you could end up being an amillennialist because that's exactly what they do or anything other than a pre-tribulationist. So the son of was born to Zacharias would be, he would go before uh, in the spirit and power of Elias and that was who? Who? John the Baptist. So John the Baptist was the forerunner of Christ. There are those out there that believe that when it says in Malachi, that happened right here in Luke chapter 1. And so that allows them to change their position and say that's how John the Baptist is one of the two witnesses because he, he's the Elijah-like. That's exactly, that's exactly how they come up with that. And it leads to ultimately in their theology to the church going through the tribulation period without any, uh, no rapture at all. John's ministry was a ministry to prepare the nation of Israel for the coming of the king. It is also concluded that Elijah, who is to come before the great, notice the wording, the great and terrible day of the Lord, can have uh, only one ministry there, and that of preparing a remnant in Israel for the second advent of Christ. No such ministry uh, <clears throat> is not intended for the church. The church is gone. The church in Ephesians 5, by nature, is without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, Paul said. It is holy, he said, and without blemish. That's how God sees us. Now, when you look at me, you probably don't see me that way. But don't, that's all right, because when I look at you, I don't always see you that way either, you know. But can you imagine God looking down from heaven and looking at us and seeing us that way? I live with me, okay? I know how I can be. But <clears throat> some people believe that this has already happened. So how they miss the wording in Matthew, Malachi 4, verses 5, I'm not sure. But the two passages, these two passages, the testing of the earth dwellers, Revelation 3.10, and the preparation for Israel for the king, that, that's part of the purpose of the tribulation. That's, uh, listen, they have no relation to the church. The last thing I want to mention is the unity of the 70th week, because I started there. The 70th week of the prophecy, <clears throat> all of it, is in view when it is described and predicted in prophecy. And so while all would agree on the basis, and I didn't read this far, but I told you to read a few verses further, Daniel 9, 27 and Matthew 24, 15 and Revelation 13, that the week is divided into two parts, three and a half years and three and a half years. The nature and character of the week is seen as one week it becomes impossible to permit the existence of the church in the week as a unit, and it becomes equally impossible to adopt the position that the church, although exempt from a portion, some would say, of the 70th week, may be in the first habit, for its nature is the same all the way through the 70th week. So you can't say, well, the church goes it through this much or this much or this much, and, uh, you know, right at the, like, I don't know, the, the last three days of the 70th week, then the church is raptured up. The post-tribbers have the church going up and down right away. Like, so I just, I don't, I don't see that. Anyway, I'll give you a few more reasons why next week. I think next week I'll start out with the nature of the church. And uh, we'll see what happens. All right, let's pray. Father, as we look at this, um, this time that is coming upon the earth, we took a pause in what we were studying as we were going through and talked about a few of these other things. We're in a parenthetical portion. Lord, help us to uh, <clears throat> understand two things. 
that the church is not Israel and Israel is not the church. And help us understand that your program for Israel is incomplete. It's not finished. But one day, it will be. And we are grateful for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Eric Mack.